Jerry Johnson, I was fascinated by that interview that we featured that you did. Uh, where was it? Michigan somewhere? It was in Grand Rapids. In Grand Rapids, Michigan, which is sort of a, at least at one time, was kind of a mecca for evangelical ministries, as I recall. It is. It's the publishing uh, mecca of the Christian world. Yeah, and a lot of, a lot of uh, churches there, almost in every corner. Uh, here's a lovely girl from a, probably a middle-income family, uh, four siblings, uh, Christian parents, going to church, and she's standing there telling you that she tried to gas herself and then she tried to cut her veins. Her story it reminds us, though, when we said the other day that suicides are preventable, that this is a preventable act, yeah. what we mean by that is no one has the suicide doom sentence on them. Now, Christy Buck was notified by the assistant principal that Katie, a junior, needed help. Every Wednesday, she went to the high school campus for one hour, 7 a.m., for two years. And through that two-year process, helped her understand that she was clinically depressed. This girl needed more than just a prayer and a pat on the back. She discovered those realities, learned how to navigate through her mental illness that is authentic with some people, as we know, and she's alive and happy today. Yeah, really, and, and actually the story brings up two interesting points. Uh, going back to the book that you've written, Why They Die, Curing the Death Wish in Our Kids, uh, in your chapter about common myths about suicide, uh, one of the myths that you comment on there is that uh, suicide is hereditary. Uh, and, and Katie talked about her family telling her that there was some hereditary depression issues in the past. But is suicide hereditary? Suicide as a final act is not. Mental illness can be, as any psychiatrist or mental health therapist would say. I look forward to Stan Kucher, the expert there at Dalhousie University in Halifax, when he really will help us understand faith and mental illness. And he makes it extremely clear. He's created that curriculum for Canadian high schools. Uh, this young lady was helped. You know, what I love about balanced Christianity is, of course, we believe in spiritual deliverance. We understand the demonic and the power of the blood of Christ. We understand the, the incredible use of the rhema, the word of God spoken specifically to an area. But unlike Scientologists, we also thank God for the technological advances of our society and that we live in a world, unlike Spurgeon, who was in London a century ago, who suffered from clinical depression his entire ministry, wrote about it in all of his journals, where there's good medications. Unlike Scientologists, we believe in the effective use of qualified psychiatrists, mental health therapists, who can properly diagnose, and in the right circumstances, they can prescribe the right medications. Now, the problem is that some people uh, with, a, I think, a sense of uh, superiority, look at someone who is suffering from depression and says, you are not exercising enough faith. Uh, you're not spiritually tuned. If you're really walking with Jesus, you wouldn't be going through this depression and lay a guilt trip on a person who's going through this. That is uh, absolutely unfair to a person yeah. who is clinically depressed, yeah. who has a mental illness. Yeah. In the book, I tell about one of my early pastors, nationally known, who committed suicide. And I want to remind all of us that in the Hall of Faith, through the centuries of the Christian church, there have been disappointments of people who had faith in Christ who committed suicide, or as we say, completed suicide. You know, historically in the medieval ages, Dante used to say there was a special place in hell for those who committed suicide. I disagree with Dante, as do most evangelicals. Um, they say suicide is a forgivable act. Well, of course it is. Mm. It's a gestation of a problem, and it's nothing more than the ultimate statement of saying, I feel hopeless. Katie tells us today there is hope, and I'm sitting here today to say there's hope too because I had that same predisposition. Yes, you did. Now, this, this gal, who, what's her name, uh, who showed up to help her? Christy Buck. Christy Buck. How is it, first of all, the uh, school knew about her, and secondly, how far away did she live? Well, what's happening in Canada and the U.S. Yeah. is with Kuchar in, in Halifax, we're now teaching mental health in high schools. It's a great advancement here in Canada. I applaud the Canadian government. The U.S. is doing the same thing. So Christy was teaching mental health. She, she should be a CNN hero of the year. I've never been around a 38-year-old spark plug quite like her. And now 20,000 kids are learning the realities of mental health and they're learning the resources that are available. She made the commitment to Katie. 
Katie is alive because of her beautiful, beautiful demonstration of love. So this gal was teaching in her school. Uh, she came periodically, ah. but she took the extra step as we all should. And that's why we're emphasizing this book, Jim. I mean, we have the privilege here at Crossroads to take a lot of data. This isn't just something that Don and I cooked up. I mean, we're quoting scores of experts all over North America. It is a focus on Canada and the U.S. That's what makes the book unique. And it means that every pastor in Canada, every faculty member, every youth worker should and must get this book because it will be used way beyond the emphasis of our two weeks. Now, now speaking of that, uh, we have, to this point in time, I think, uh, focused pretty much on young people committing suicide. Right. But talking about data, and you have a lot of data in here, and that, when I was reading the book, my eyes glazed over at times. There's so much in here, and it's really valuable. Seniors are also afflicted by this uh, horrible reality. It is, and Dr. Crosby at the Centers for Disease Control and Dr. Kucher, and that's why our friends must stay with us for the, every day, yeah. because it's not gonna be a repeat. We are bringing yeah. new installments of information. Yeah. But the pendulum goes like this. Adolescent suicide, there's a spike. It goes down to middle age. And there is a phenomenon about 45 to 55, where suicide spikes again, middle age, okay? Yeah. And then it goes down, but senior adults is the hi highest age group per capita that take their life. So we're not talking about an adolescent only phenomenon. Uh, I think there are many that watch uh, 100 Huntley Street that represent an older age demographic. They probably have a friend or someone among their peers that has a suicidal ideation why they die could probably help them in a life-saving way. Yeah, I, I uh, totally agree. Now, um, one, one thing, let's, let's move beyond the um, uh, common myths. Uh, you have a chapter here called Life and Death Less Lessons for Teachers. Um, do we realize how important a teacher can be in someone's life? I mean, <laughs> teachers, teachers really get the, the short end of the stick in many ways these days for various reasons, but teachers really play a critical role. Well, let me just say this. Teachers, clergy, youth pastors, we all have to work together. You know, I've been real close to this phenomenon. I pastored a young man who was an intellectual rights specialist. Bill Gates would only get on the phone if he was on the phone. Uh, he was acclaimed in his field as a young attorney who took his life. We remembered him with a very small plaque that just said, For Chris. The reality is he showed the warning signs. And so teaching mental health, teaching the realities of something that heretofore has been quite stigmatized. I mean, let's face it, we don't talk about this too often. We don't mention the pastor <coughs> who pastored me who took his life. And we should because it is an opportunity for us to be interventionist. Now, let's just talk about that for the last two minutes before we move on. How did this impact you? Your pastor, successful, well-known, takes his own life. What, what was your gut reaction and what was your um, analysis of the situation knowing him as you did? In his case, he had failed morally. And we know that a person's morality affects his theology. Yeah. It certainly ex affects his spirituality. This was a covert affair for about five years. And I believe the Holy Spirit was dealing with him. He left the church we were attending to take one of the largest churches in the country. I preached for him one day. We're standing on a platform, 4,000 seats. He turned to me and said, Jerry, do you see why I came? And I wanted to say, no, I really don't. The congregation was lethargic, and, but it was him. You could tell there was something wrong. And so he ended up you know, being disclosed, and then later goes to a cemetery, takes a shotgun, attempts to take his life, and doesn't complete suicide, struggles while a lady sees him, drives 15 minutes, calls 911. By the time they get there, he's dead. <clears throat> Had she responded quicker, he might still be alive today. You know, we can't de-emphasize what Carl Menninger made clear at Menninger Psychiatric Hospital in Topeka. Remember what he wrote, whatever happened to sin? Hmm. So there is a reality of sin. Be sure your sins will find you out. 
For Christians, we live in spiritual light. And if we go back to darkness by behavior that is not a part of the light, I think we do open ourselves to what Paul said, don't give place, tell us, a, a door and a dresser door. Don't open up the smallest cupboard of your life. When we saw that, his son called me, a very renowned attorney, and he said, Jerry, my dad took his life. The fact is, he had made the attempt once before, but his ceilings were so high in his large house that carbon monoxide went to the, to the ceiling and it was not enough to kill himself. He thought he would you know, lay in a basement bedroom and it'd be adequate. When someone makes any gesture, any verbal intention, any preoccupation with death themes, we cannot be idle. We must move and move quickly. And that's why, again, yeah. I just say the book is the key. Yeah, the, bo the book is called Why They Die, Curing the Death Wish in Our Kids. It's our offer to you, friends, as you support the ongoing challenging ministry of Crossroads Christian Communications. Crossroads is making a concerted effort to be on the cutting edge. And if there's anything that is a cutting edge issue right now, it is this pandemic of suicide. Uh, all the secular press are talking about it. Uh, you've seen cover stories in magazines about it. This is as current and as relevant uh, an issue as can be. And we're trying our best to be a part of the solution. And so Jerry Johnson's book, along with uh, Don Simmons, is a terrific resource, something you're going to want to have for yourself and for others that you love. one 288 is the number. Give us a call. Make this yours today.